So once we get our ultrasound, we're going to find one of several different findings here. Actually, one of five. The first is that we could find that this patient has a viable IUP. The patient's diagnosis then is threatened AB, and she is referred for routine prenatal care and given precautions on what she should call the clinic or office for and also under what circumstances should she return to the acute care facility. patient may have a non-viable IUP, which would be either a blighted ovum, which is an empty gestational sac, or an embryonic demise. In other words, an embryo that's large enough to determine that it should already have cardiac activity. The other way to diagnose an embryonic demise is over a period of time show that the embryo has not developed cardiac activity but also is not growing and typically we try to get those scans about a week apart if we're going to show that an embryo is not growing. In this situation as long as the patient is not acute you're not in a big hurry to treat her. But she does have one of three treatment options. And many patients actually elect to have a repeat ultrasound in order to confirm that the diagnosis is correct, that she does have a non-viable IUP. So the first thing the patient can do is elect expectant management because many of the patients will go ahead and miscarry if you simply wait long enough. Now, a lot of patients don't like to wait and it can take several weeks for a pregnancy to spontaneously pass. So I think you have to have the right patient who really strongly desires expectant management, but also she needs to understand that some form of intervention may be necessary if the pregnancy won't pass all by itself. The second thing you could do is some form of medical management with mesoprostol plus or minus mifepristone. If you use mesoprostol alone, then that's going to give you about an 88% success rate. If you add mifepristone to mesoprostol, then that's going to give you about a 93% success rate. And our final option would be for suction DNC. And a suction DNC is about 98% successful at removing all the products of conception. So there are a few patients who will have some retained products after suction DNC and may need another intervention. So we could have an IUP, but the viability of the IUP is unknown. In other words, the pregnancy is too early to detect viability for certain and it's too soon to say for sure that the pregnancy is not viable because it's just not big enough. And so in that case we would like to repeat the ultrasound in one week. Now for all three of these situations if we needed to assess the viability of the pregnancy at any point we would do that with ultrasound. We would not do that with quantitative beta HCGs. And the reason is because the pregnancy is either viable or it's not. 
on any given determination, and it's either growing or it's not, based on serial determinations at ultrasound. And so I think it's important to understand that once you know it's an IUP, then that patient should be followed only with ultrasound and quantitative beta HCGs don't have value in this clinical setting. The other diagnostic category we have is ectopic pregnancy. And patients who definitively have an ectopic pregnancy on their pelvic ultrasound will end up typically with one of two treatment options, either methotrexate for appropriate candidates or laparoscopy with some form of tubal surgery, either salpingostomy or salpingectomy. It's also important to note what are the patient's contraceptive plans? Because if you have somebody who has sought a tubal ligation and wasn't able to get it for one reason or another, this is an opportunity to affect sterilization in patients who desire it. It's not that you want to push a patient into sterilization ever, but if the patient strongly desires it, has pursued it in the past, or if you have a good feeling that this patient truly, truly desires sterilization, then going to surgery for ectopic pregnancy also presents a good opportunity in order to provide that patient the contraception of her choice. The last category of patients who have pelvic ultrasound for abnormal first trimester pregnancy are the indeterminates or what we like to call the pregnancy of unknown location. Now pregnancy of unknown, unknown location is transient. In other words, the patient isn't going to stay in this category forever. She's just a pregnancy of unknown location until we figure out the location. The only patients who need to be followed with quantitative beta HCGs are patients who have a pregnancy of unknown location. Ectopic pregnancies who are treated with methotrexate do get quantitative beta HCGs as part of that treatment algorithm, but the patient is getting those quants as part of that treatment protocol and not because we're trying to determine whether the pregnancy is growing or viable or not. So in the case of the indeterminate pregnant, uh, scan or pregnancy of unknown location, then a quantitative beta HCG should be drawn and that result used to interpret the remainder of your findings as one additional piece of information to include with your lab work your radiology studies, your history, your physical exam, and your clinical intuition. A final note is, like I said, these patients are followed with quants. These patients are followed with ultrasound because they have a definitive IUP. And ectopic and IUPs definitively diagnosed by ultrasound will comprise about 70% of these patients. Only about 30% of your patients will have an indeterminate ultrasound and end up in that category pregnancy of unknown location. That's why if you wait and get a quantitative beta HCG, you could actually save the patient some money and not draw a lab test that ultimately has no diagnostic assistance in caring for your patient. The final thing to note is that while only 2% of all pregnancies are ectopic, 
If your patient presents to the ER, about 14% of those patients who present to the emergency room with signs or symptoms of abnormal first trimester pregnancy will have ectopic pregnancy. So something to keep in mind as we see patients who are more acutely ill or in the more acute care setting seeking care. So I hope this has been helpful in determining how to evaluate patients for abnormal first trimester pregnancy. There's another podcast on how to evaluate and follow the indeterminate ultrasound or the pregnancy of unknown location.